Good morning. I'm so glad to see all of you here. Um, the symposium that we planned for today has uh, arisen out of our monthly seminar, and we organized this event today to celebrate the um, 50th anniversary of the publication of The Feminine Mystique. So therefore, we invited scholars with in-depth knowledge of Betty Friedan, of the women's movement, and of the time in which it was written, as well as community activists who have worked for women's issues, as well as in the field of education, labor, um, gay and lesbian rights in Chicago, and also around the nation. Um, and I just wanted to say that when I was an undergraduate, I wrote a paper on the history of three generations of women in my family. So that gave me the opportunity to interview my mother. And I learned about the feminine mystique in class, and so I very eagerly said, you know, did you read the feminine mystique? Did it influence you? And she laughed and said, well, I didn't really have time to read it. I was busy raising children. My mother had gotten a college degree from a small Catholic women's college. Uh, she got married and was teaching. She quit teaching because she got pregnant. Um, she then had four children between 1960 and 1968, um, and then went back to work in a medical lab um, for economic reasons. And so she never fulfilled her desire to go back to teaching. So although she had not read it, I really think the feminine mystique spe speaks to a lot of those issues that she faced in the 1960s and issues that we're still facing today as women. So we're going to explore Betty Friedan's insights into gender expectations, self-fulfillment, career, family, marriage, sexuality, feminism, and the impact that her book did have on millions of women. We'll also consider some of her shortcomings, um, her lack of understanding of homosexuality, um, the way she didn't seem to grapple with class fully despite her background in the labor movement. Our speakers will share their insights into her life and her work and the impact of her book and also other influences on themselves and on their activism from the 1960s and 1970s all the way up to today. We hope that this symposium, therefore, will give us a lot of insight both into the past as well as into the present. And now it's time to introduce our first panel of scholars who will usher us into our studies of the feminine mystique. Susan Levine is a longtime friend of our seminar on women and gender. She's a professor of history at the University of Illinois, Chicago, where she heads the UIC Institute for Humanities. She's currently writing a book on international food aid to be entitled Distant Hunger, Government and Civil Society in the History of the International Food Aid. She's best known for her histories of the school lunch program, which is for sale, and also two other histories, one of the American Association of University Women and one of women and labor, carpet weaving women in the workplace. She will be our moderator. Our two panelists include Elizabeth Frederico, an associate professor of history at Loyola University. She's going to give us a view of gender in the 1960s as the author of the book Playboy and the Making of the Good Life in Modern America, published by Oxford University Press. Her current project is a history of the feminist media reforms of the 1960s and 1970s such as those called for by the National Organization for Women, the organization started by Betty Friedan and many other women. Our second panelist is Catherine Turk. She's assistant professor of history at the University of Texas at Dallas. She finished her PhD at the University of Chicago in 2011, so she has uh, familiarity with Chicago. Her dissertation won the Organization of American Historians Lerner Scott Prize for the best dissertation in women's history, which is quite an honor. Her forthcoming book is entitled Equality on Trial, Sex and Gender at Work in the Age of Title VII, forthcoming with the University of Pennsylvania Press. So we look forward to that. Thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me? It's a pleasure to have this opportunity to celebrate with all of you and to reflect upon one of the most important books in US women's history. The Feminine Mystique is many things. 
a snapshot of mid-1960s suburban life, an expose of the unfulfilled aspirations that have often accompanied the American dream, and above all, I think, an eminently readable text. Yet I would argue that the book achieved such a claim and continues to capture our attention today on account of Friedan's textured description of the frustrations felt by many white middle-class women in the early 1960s. In her very first paragraph, Friedan introduces us to her anonymous main character, the suburban wife who, quote, made the beds, shopped for groceries, matched slipcover material, ate peanut butter sandwiches with her children, chauffeured Cub Scouts and brownies, and lay anxious and awake next to her sleeping husband. The women we meet in the feminine mystique were trapped in a world where men monopolized positions of power and autonomy, and women had to sacrifice their own desires in support of their families. They were strung out, overextended yet understimulated, at once bored and exhausted, and eternally unfulfilled. In her lively prose, Friedan laid bare the dreadful double bind that ensnared these women. They could not fulfill ambitions of their own that would take them into the male-defined sphere without sacrificing their own femininity. And in a world where women's femininity was her currency, this was a risk very few felt comfortable taking. Through these descriptions, Friedan forced her readers to face the injustices wrapped up in the feminine mystique, that phalanx of culture, experts, and institutions that instructed women who were dissatisfied with their feminine roles to seek solace in ever more femininity. Yet, a less prominent element of the book is the solution that she offers to the problem that has no name. And that solution is a particular kind of wage labor. In her final chapter, entitled A New Life Plan for Women, Friedan implored women to seek, to seek paid employment outside of the domestic sphere. But according to Friedan, not just any work would do. Uh, Part-time, pink collar, and volunteer positions would not suffice. She wrote that each woman must pursue, quote, a job that she can take seriously as part of a life plan, work in which she can grow as part of society. Friedan encouraged women to, quote, look for jobs equal to their actual capacity and to pursue, quote, serious education and training while sustaining, quote, the lifelong commitment to an art or a science, to politics or profession. Friedan thus suggested that careers for women in male-dominated fields could be a panacea for the problems in American gender relations. Such employment would grant women more self-confidence and more independence. More egalitarian marriages would surely follow, and these changes would ripple throughout American society and over time put the sexes on equal footing. Thus, unlike our contemporary debates today uh, among feminists about whether women can have it all, Friedan instead implored women to seize it all. She said they must sort of try to take it all if they were ever to solve the problem that has no name. The feminine mystique has become a touchstone, touchstone of American women's history, shaping historians' most dearly held understandings of the causes and progression of post-war American feminism. One such scholarly narrative in particular draws from Friedan's, Friedan's approach to wage labor. According to that narrative, the feminine mystique in inspired millions of women to re-examine their own lives, and Friedan helped to channel the frustration her book brought to light when she founded the National Organization for Women, or NOW, in 1966. Once founded, NOW's initial mission was to convince reluctant federal authorities to enforce new workplace discrimination laws that were designed to weaken the gender division of labor and to break women into male-dominated areas of the workforce. The same step Friedan argued would be critical if we were ever to create sex equality. In this version of history, women's collective desire to work side by side and on equal terms with men was the engine that propelled the feminist movement. In my opinion, there are three main problems with this narrative in terms of women and the workplace, and two of these have already yielded fertile intellectual ground for other scholars. The first is Friedan's implication that women were not already working for wages in huge numbers. Uh, for millions of working class women, and women of color in particular, paid labor was not a privilege or a choice, but a necessity, particularly as the cost of living escalated throughout the 1950s and 1960s. The second problem with this account uh, is reflected in Friedan's assumption that women would be able to ob obtain autonomous, fulfilling, and well-paid work. Uh, in short, work that would enhance their lives. For many women, wage work took place in oppressive conditions and offered little financial reward, 
And for many such women, staying out of the labor force often seemed a more enticing uh, opportunity. For women who lacked elite training in a professional field, for example, pursuing a career to say nothing of the sexist logic that ordered the gender division of labor, underscored the wide pay disparity between jobs seen as appropriate for men and women, and legitimated the discouragement and outright harassment women often faced when they sought to cross over into male-typed work. By drawing a bright line between careers and other forms of employment, Friedan thus revealed her implicit biases about what type of work had value and what type of work deserved respect and a good wage. In so doing, Friedan both foreshadowed and contributed to the class divisions that would frustrate feminist efforts for the decades to come. But the third problem with this narrative of progression from the feminine mystique to now to united feminist attacks on the gender division of labor is sort of where my research sort of comes in. Um, and that problem, I think, is that it flattens contemporary feminist textured responses to the problem of wage labor. So contemporary, you know, in the 1960s and 70s, feminist textured responses to the problem of wage labor for women. More specifically, this account supports scholars' tendency to force feminist activism of the 1960s and the 1970s into a narrow binary between liberal feminists who prioritized moving women into male-type jobs and generally accepted the terms of those jobs as men had already defined them, and radical feminists whose critique of the workplace was bound up in their broader concerns with capitalism, the state, and hierarchy in all of its forms. According to this paradigm, state-oriented feminism, or sort of liberal feminist approaches to the state, had little to offer pink-collar workers beyond helping them to escape. And neither did liberal feminists have a response to employers' campaigns to expand the service sector and degrade the jobs that were there. My research reveals that this binary is far too simplistic. Uh, it, pa it, it papers over what was, instead, a range of bold and diverse visions of workplace rights that many women offered when the legal foundations of their rights at work were transformed. It also denies the incredible contingency of the decade between the mid-1960s and the 1970s, when the promise of sex equality in the workforce was widely contested among women workers, uh, among feminists and labor rights activists, uh, and among attorneys and judges and government bureaucrats alike. The year after Friedan penned The Feminine Mystique, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Title VII was the section of that law that outlawed sex discrimination in employment. And uh, when Title VII was passed, it thus butted up against hundreds of state laws that required employers to treat women workers differently precisely on account of sex. Those state laws, which were thought to protect women from the ravages of the industrial workforce, regulated the hours and conditions of women's wage labor. So protective laws um, sort of defined what kinds of women's uh, work women could do, the hours they could work, um, the amount of weight they could lift on the job, these types of things. And they were thought to really uh, protect women from being put in a position where they would have to work uh, in jobs that they couldn't uh, perform. So um, Title VII, by contrast, seemed to undermine these state provisions, this new federal law. Uh, but the new law of Title VII did not define sex discrimination in the workplace or identify its remedies. Over the next several decades, government officials were stymied by confusion and conflict over the new law of sex equality. Uh, by contrast, however, varied populations of women and men were not similarly perplexed about what their new rights at work were. Uh, and instead, they directed self-fashioned rights claims towards a state that was newly empowered to field and address them through the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or EEOC. Some of these rights claims expressed the view that the sexes should be interchangeable at work, that women needed to just move into jobs that men already had. Um, but many more of these rights claims really hinged on the idea of substantive equality, right? So to be treated fairly rather than to have access to what men already had. That fairness required more than just women, moving women into male-dominated jobs. In those same years, uh, burgeoning labor and feminist organizations built multivalent campaigns against targeted employers. Uh, gay and lesbian workers organized in their local communities to demand protections for freer gender and sexual identity expression under Title VII. Uh, men fought under Title VII for the right to enter some of the same feminized professions, such as nursing, that women fought to leave. Um, and so as a result of all of these uh, sort of 
diverse visions of equality and all of these sort of new challenges under the new federal law of sex equality. Workplaces and lawsuits became crucial sites of political activism where bold and diverse visions of sex equality were tested. But perhaps uh, most important for our purposes here today, uh, the new law of sex equality also became a critical weapon for feminists, feminist activists, who advanced a range of ideas about the, what, about what the new law of workplace equality promised to women, and they developed new movement building tactics to advance their agenda. In particular, they advocated for a strain of equality that could coexist with differences between the sexes and would flatten gender and class hierarchies in the workplace. Among their most significant goals were improving the pink collar jobs where women were clustered and fighting off employers' attempts to widen the division between full-time and contingent labor. Many of feminists' most innovative strategies for workplace justice unfolded right here in Chicago. In 1974, our own Ann Ladke, and I say our own because I know she'll be here this afternoon if she's not already here, um, our own Ann Ladke testified before the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights about the employment practices of Sears, Roebuck, and Company. At that time, Sears was pioneering the same tactics to disempower and divide workers that retailers have perfected today to keep workers contingent and impoverished. Ladke framed these tactics uh, as violations of sex equality law. She asked the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, quote, if part-time employment involves doing work that is substantially equal to work done by full-time employees, should benefits be denied to part-timers? How many Sears workers are subsidized under public assistance and the food stamp program? Is the public, in effect, subsidizing Sears' low wages? Sounds like Anne, right, for those who know her? Ladke argued that economic security was a civil right and that hard work deserved an honest wage. In her view, new laws that ban sex discrimination should prevent employers from cashing in on assumptions that framed women and their labors as inherently less valuable than men's. This practice was a vital public concern, Ladke claimed, because all Americans were harmed by Sears' efforts to reclassify workers and depress their wages under the logic of sex difference. Yet, over the decades, this vision of a more egalitarian workplace that I've described, uh, a more egalitarian workplace buttressed by strong and flexible sex equality laws, does not did not come to pass, has not come to pass yet, anyway. Uh, government agencies, in the end, reframed and rationalized workers' demands in pursuit of administrative efficiency. Attorneys worked within existing legal channels to build viable cases, in the end often sacrificing broad claims for winnable claims. Massive national corporations and small employers alike fought to, uh, to, fought to oppose or limit the changes that workers sought, oftentimes or uh, reorganizing and de-skilling feminized jobs in pursuit of profitability. And feminists' own ideological and strategic rifts over time uh, surround, surrounding the questions of workplace rights uh, in the end splintered their movement pretty severely. In particular, as more elite women gained access to professional jobs, they tended to leave the claims of their working class sisters behind. Many came to view feminism as an individualistic rather than a collective movement. And by the early 1990s, workers, activists, jurists, had all come to mostly agree that expanding women's access to employment and downplaying or denying sex and gender at work comprised the full content and scope of the sex equality promised by Title VII. I argue that this outcome deepened pre-existing class hierarchies, wage disparities, and patterns of de-skilling while upholding white heterosexual masculine privilege and all under the banner of sex equality. So in the end, many middle class women, like those pro, uh, profiled by Friedan, were able to take advantage of sex equality laws, and they ultimately gained the professional employment she prescribed. But that access did not re represent the entirety of women's initial aspirations. In addition, women's entry into professional occupations has refracted, rather than resolved, the gender inequalities that continue to sort of haunt and plague the workplace and wider society today. So while we gather today to honor the feminine mystique, I think we should also be mindful of instances where scholars have taken the book at its word a bit too much. In particular, Friedan's contention that women's entry into the professions, as men had already set the terms of such professions, uh, this idea that this entry 
would resolve gender inequalities has, I think, compelled historians to overlook women's and men's more nuanced and diverse understandings of what their state-enforced rights at work should be. If we look a few years past Friedan's call to action, we see that many of the women who were inspired by the swell of energy, uh, feminist energy in the mid-60s, driven in large part by the feminine mystique, rose up to claim entry into the workplace and to claim their new rights at work. As they did so, they advocated for, many of them advocated for a particular interpret interpretation of Title VII that held that removing the obstacles between them and what men already had did not go far enough to create a meaningful uh, meaningful change and sort of meaningful equality in the workplace. Their contention that the law of sex equality should encompass substantive fairness, both access and accommodation, and both firmness and flexibility in the law seems even less plausible to us today than it did then. But that should not diminish the significance or viability of their perspective in our eyes as we look back nor should it deter us from looking to their strategies and struggles as we imagine and strive for workplace justice in our own challenging times. Hello. Uh, I'm actually going to focus on um, Betty Friedan's critique of the image of women in the feminine mystique. And I'd like to start out by offering a brief discussion of the main themes of the book, and then turn to talk a little bit more specifically about what Friedan said about the image of women. Uh, and then talk a little bit about how that influenced subsequent feminist media criticism and media activism. Betty Friedan introduced the American public in 1963 to the problem that has no name. These were the inarticulate longings of American women who wrote occupation housewife on the census form. Women who lived in quiet desperation, troubled by feelings of emptiness, as they lived out the role that was supposed to bring fulfillment. Women who wondered about their own personal failings for not finding satisfaction in marriage and motherhood. Feminine mystique, Ferdinand argued, was a strange and powerful for force that took hold toward the end of the Second World War and for the next decade and a half, directed women into early marriage. It convinced them that they would find happiness there, not in pursuit of personal ambitions outside the home, but by being truly feminine and embracing their roles as wives and mothers. Who or what was to blame for the feminine mystique, according to Ferdinand? She pointed to advertisers, experts, and educators whose advice and wisdom all really amounted to one thing, that woman's place was in the home. But women were not without fault for their un unhappy confinement at home. They had mistakenly chosen security rather than striving for a greater sense of self in the world outside its doors. Yet, Ferdinand also pointed out, women's acquiescence to the feminine mystique, to the pull of domesticity, was understandable. Who could blame them for choosing the path to occupation housewife when all other roads were riddled with obstacles? the cultural baggage of the feminine mystique, the peer pressure to conform, the structural impediments to women's access to education and employment. For Ferdan, women's confinement to domestic life kept her from realizing her potential as a human being. And the harmful effects were not just felt by her, but would be felt by future generations. For how could a mother with such an undeveloped sense of self ever hope to raise a self-possessed daughter? And so her daughter, unwilling or unable to pursue the hard road toward independence and self-actualization, would continue the cycle. She would, rush into the, uh, she would rush to the altar at the first opportunity and go on to live out her own life of quiet desperation, which would wreak havoc upon her children, and so on and so on. Ferdinand thus positioned her book as an intervention. She called upon readers to break the cycle and free themselves from the housewife trap. In the past, she said women had mistakenly chosen between marriage and career. But one could sidestep this perilous choice by developing a new life plan that would enable one to embrace marriage and motherhood without losing oneself. Essential to the new life plan was the pursuit of meaningful education. And it was through education that a woman would develop both her interests and her abilities, two things that were key to developing one's own identity 
and they were also, of course, instrumental in being able to find a job. And by job, of course, for Dan meant, as Catherine pointed out, um, a career, socially useful paid employment, not voluntary community work, not some low level position uh, just to get out of the house once in a while. The path to combining career and family would not be an easy one for Dan admitted. And while individual women might succeed in living out a new life plan and thus be saved from the problem that has no name, Ferdan recognized that the larger context of women's lives also needed to be transformed. So along with calling for um, new academic models and federal supports for women's continuing education, Ferdan also announced, quote, we need a drastic reshaping of the cultural image of femininity that will permit women to reach matur maturity, identity, completeness of self. Now, she offered no further comment in the book about how such a powerful, pervasive image might be changed. But in the years that followed, feminist activists and media crit critics would take up this charge. And so I'd like to just turn and talk a little bit about the specific critique of the image of women then that she launched in this book. The idea that cultural forces aligned to produce a limited and limiting range of women permeates for Dan's book. And among the many sources that she claimed had worked to channel women into the home in the post-war period were the mass women's magazines. And here, Ferdinand sort of drew upon her insider status as a part-time or a sometime contributor to these magazines to lay bare their role in creating and sustaining the feminine mystique. She looked through one issue of McCall's magazine and claimed, woman's world was confined to her own body and beauty, the charming of man, the bearing of babies, and the physical care and serving of husband, children, and home. Such narrowly construed interests were not limited, though, to a single issue of a single publication, according to Ferdan. This was the editorial fair offered by all of the major women's magazines month after month. And even more concerning was the ominous shift Ferdan detected in the short stories presented from the 1930s to the 1950s. Spirited career girls, she said, making their way in the world, had once populated the pages of the magazine. But the female writers and editors who created these exciting characters had since gone away. They were replaced by men. And it was the male writers and editors, she said, that were primarily responsible for the creation of the new character that dominated the post-war era in the women's magazines. And she dubbed this the happy housewife hero heroine, um, whose, whose personal ambitions were always um, uh, surpassed when, when love and marriage entered into the picture. Um, and her adventures in these, these various tales always centered on home and family. Now, what was the purpose of this? Ferdan said that women who were so focused on home and family formed a desirable audience for the advertisers of personal and household goods who were trying to reach them. And I'm quoting here. In all the talk of femininity and woman's role, one forgets that the real business of America is business. But the growth of the feminine mystique makes sense and dollars when one realizes that women are the chief customers of American business. So what Ferdan called the sexual sell included advertisements that promoted youth, physical beauty, conventional femininity, which played upon women's anxieties about the need to appear sexually attractive to men. Ad men went even further, though, in their use of the sexual sell by honing in on housewives' discontent. As Ferdinand put it, somehow, somewhere, someone must have figured out that women will buy more things if they are kept in the underused, nameless, yearning, energy to get rid of state of being housewives. And so advertisers and motivational researchers, recognizing that housework was, in fact, dull and endless, tried to make it seem more creative, requiring expertise and the, skill, uh, the skillful use of products and equipment. And other conveniences, from appliances to cake mixes, could be sold as conveniences, um, things that were time savers that would allow women to bestow even more attention on their families. And the training for this life of endless consumption began early, quoting for Dan. Like a primitive culture which sacrificed little girls to its tribal gods, we sacrifice our girls to the feminine mystique, grooming them ever more efficiently through the sexual cell to become consumers of the things to whose profitable sale our nation is dedicated. And here, Ferdinand was really joining a, uh, with contemporary social commentators such as Vance Packard and John Kenneth Galbraith 
uh, in critiquing the prevalence of empty consumption in post-war America, but she added an understanding of its gender dimensions. The cultural image of women, she informed readers, was harnessed to capitalism. Now, scholars have um, pointed to the limitations and the omissions of the feminine mystique. Um, to begin with, Ferdan certainly overlooked the experiences of working class women and women of color. They were neither represented in the images of femininity she found in the women's magazines, nor did they have access to the comfortable lifestyles of dulling conformity that she pointed out in places like Westchester County, New York. Verdan offered a limited vision of white middle class problems, and she offered middle class solutions. Yet, as did so many other commentators of the day, she spoke in very totalizing language about the American woman. She also exaggerated the extent to which post-war women's magazines promoted the feminine mystique by overlooking images of non-home-centered success also found in their pages, especially in non-fiction profiles of accomplished women. And furthermore, although Ferdan claimed for, that for years, amid celebrations of femininity and togetherness, scarcely a word had been spoken about the problem that has no name, scholars have shown that uh, women's magazines, in fact, trained a spotlight to some extent on the tensions and frustrations women experienced as wives and mothers. And from this perspective, Rather than being the first to break the silence, the feminine mystique represented an important contribution to a conversation that was already starting to take place a little bit. Nevertheless, Ferdan did offer a powerful explication of how women's cap capacities were underutilized when they devoted themselves to homemaking and child rearing to the exclusion of all else. And significantly, she pointed to the centrality of cultural messages in a mass-mediated society for prospects of girls and boys, men and women. Ferdan took seriously the power of cultural representations, even something as trivial, as seemingly trivial as magazine fiction and advertising, to frame the choices and shape lives of, of women. Ferdan pioneered then as a feminist media critic, and she pointed the way for other feminists in the 1960s and subsequent decades to begin thinking about popular media and entertainment as important sites of struggle in their larger movement for social change. When Ferdan joined with other activists to found the National Organization for Women in 1966, she brought with her the sense that transforming images would be necessary if one also wanted to transform lives. And here they took a cue from the media activists of the civil rights movement, which, uh, who struggled to eradicate racist stereotypes from popular culture. Now's statement of purpose in 1966 announced, among other things, in the interests of the human dignity of women, we will protest and endeavor to, and endeavor to change the false image of women now prevalent in mass media. Such images perpetuate contempt for women by society and by women for themselves. For feminists in now and elsewhere, the sense then that the image of women was a central support of the status quo, or put another way, was a formidable obstacle to women's advancement, inspired numerous critiques and media activism. And for Dan's book really hints at the issues that they would take on. Advertisements that sexualized young girls or portrayed women as frivolous consumers, a dearth of positive images of women in diverse roles, the preponderance of males who controlled mass media and thus wielded considerable power in shaping images of feminism and femininity. Time and again throughout the feminine mystique, Ferdinand suggested that in the absence of other visions and role models, girls could hardly fathom an alternative to the housewife role. And following this logic, feminists believe that more diverse representations would enable girls and young women to imagine an adult life that valued their talents and intellect and contained more than marriage and motherhood. And so they took action on a number of fronts. They challenged, for example, the male-dominated women's magazines. They challenged children's toy manufacturers and book authors who perpetuated gender stereotypes sexist advertisements of all kinds, and one thinks of the Barefoot and Pregnant Awards that now did um, for sexist advertisements, um, their This Ad Insults Women campaign, and then later um, the, the Meat Market Awards that they offered um, for various um, sexist depictions of women in, cult in popular culture. 
They challenged images of women in television, motion pictures, and other forms of popular culture that confined women to the domestic role or upheld a traditional gender hierarchy. And the critical examination of mass media also prompted scrutiny of the sexual objectification of women, which became even more heightened as the pornography industry began to flourish in the late 1960s. Now, Ferdinand could not have anticipated the fracturing effect on the women's movement of the feminist anti-pornography activism that peaked in the 1980s, but her claim that the media environment mattered certainly figures in its lineage. Despite, despite pointing to such fertile ground for change, Ferdinand's call for a drastic reshaping of the image of femininity had failed to address a central paradox. The challenge for disempowered groups to change the way they are culturally represented, thereby producing, in theory, a more favorable climate for social change, is that without power, they also lack access to the mechanisms of image production. And now activists address this matter in a variety of ways. They succeeded in pressing the Federal Communications Commission to comply with Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and they worked to help women gain access to high-level positions within the broadcasts and entertainment industries. They also petitioned the FCC to deny licenses to broadcasters guilty of sexist programming practices. And here it's worth mentioning that in doing so, they joined forces with other media activists in a broader media reform movement against things such as television violence um, and against things such as racial and ethnic stereotyping in programming. Also worth mentioning is that in filing these petitions with the FCC, um, on the grounds that they constituted part of the public, and the FCC regulates in the public interest, um, they were making an important claim to citizenship. Um, and, and they also trained women activists to monitor television programming and to, to be informed, savvy consumers of media, but also to see themselves as citizens who could make a claim on the federal government if their interests were not being served. Hindsight shows us that female access did not necessarily bring acceptance of feminist goals, though. The cultural image of women certainly began to broaden, but other troubling images took the place of those that preoccupied Friedan in the late 1950s and early 1960s. The 20th century trend toward the sexualization of culture and the commercialization of sex continued unabated after 1963. And as it turned out, women's advancement in advertising and broadcasting did not bring an end to the creation of sexist but profitable images. And I'd like to just uh, offer a few additional thoughts um, in, in closing. In, in looking back at this work, it's easy to see how Ferdan, like any writer or historian for that matter, was really enmeshed in her own historical moment. For instance, for all of her discussion of the need for change, Ferdinand assumed that childcare was primarily a mother's responsibility. And it's not without some irony that those who posed a more dramatic challenge to conventional notions of fem femininity drew Ferdinand's disapproval. Women who were deemed militant feminists offered a farther reaching critique of the family as a patriarchal and heterosexist in institution. Lesbian feminists, whose presence in the women's movement helped bring sexual politics to the forefront, seemed to threaten the project of women's advancement as Ferdinand envisioned it, not least in part because of the image of feminism they seemed to embody. Finally, it's also uh, apparent in retrospect that by exposing and critiquing the image of femininity that sustained what she viewed as a harrowing gender system, Ferdinand herself became an image maker. Even as some women might have recognized the roots of their own despair in her writing, the fact remained that Ferdinand's image of the housewife was far from flattering. In years to come, as feminists mobilized in support of the ERA, they found it difficult to shake feminism's association with the denigration of the housewife implied in the phrase, just a housewife. The feminine mystique remains a powerful critique of the post-war era as well as a fascinating artifact of that era. From the vantage point of a half century after its publication, it is clear why this accessible text was both so stimulating and so vexing for audiences. Its imprint on subsequent activism is also clear, even if its bold proposals were far from easily or altogether accomplished, and were not always quite as bold as Ferdinand imagined. Thank you for letting me share with you some thoughts about this important book. <laughs>
Let's see, is this good? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, thanks to our speakers today, and I'd also like to thank Francesca and Joan and Michelle for organizing this symposium, and to the Newberry Library for hosting so many wonderful seminars, but the Women and Gender Seminar in particular, um, and uh, for giving us this chance to revisit um, the feminine mystique at 50. I was uh, pleased to have the opportunity to dig out my original copy, my paperback copy of the book, which I would have brought, but it's getting pretty yellow and uh, crispy, so I put it in a plastic bag, but the cover says 75 cents, so <laughs> it shows you how far we've come. Um, how many of you actually read The Feminine Mystique? A lot of people in this room. When I ask my you know, uh, students that, of course, they haven't, but, um, and a lot of uh, people in, in uh, my own uh, experience think they've read it, um, but uh, it was good to have a chance to go back and actually reread it. Um, so looking back at the feminine mystique, um, we realize how far we've come and of course how far we still have to go to reach that equitable and just society that Betty Friedan imagined. Um, her book articulated, um, as our speakers have, have pointed out, underlying discontents among American women, especially white middle class women, although I'm going to argue that the book also spoke to discontents and goals that um, addressed a wider range of women as well. The book appeared at a moment when the country was poised on the verge of profound social transformation in race relations as well as in changing gender roles. The social movement that emerged after 1963, what historians have called the second wave of feminism, drew on many of her insights and created a new consciousness among both men and women. At the same time, though, I would argue that this very second wave of feminism was itself limited by many of the assumptions and omissions that our speakers have so clearly outlined. The feminine mystique, the problem that had no name, have become so familiar, um, such familiar tropes in our view of gender relations and women's lives during the 1950s, so familiar, I would argue, that we should look again at what exactly that problem was and um, that Friedan articulated and what solutions she Posed. So my goal this morning is to look at the critiques that our speakers have proposed and then to look again at what Friedan wrote um, and how some of the ideas played out among the 1960s feminists and finally what all this might mean for us today. Now as Catherine Turk rightly points out, Friedan suggested that women needed a purpose in life in addition to their roles as wives and mothers. Such a purpose, she, Friedan argued, could be found in careers, work outside the home. And Turk clearly lays out the limitations of that solution. For one thing, by the 1950s, despite the domestic rhetoric and the popular images of the period, large numbers of women were already working for wages outside the home. Furthermore, for most working women, the job was not a source of personal fulfillment, although I would say that it might have been a source of autonomy and certainly economic independence for many women. Um, Friedan, Turk argues, draws a bright line between ordinary wage work and fulfilling careers, and thus leaves most working women and certainly most women of color out of the picture. Finally, Turk argues the idea of a career flattens contemporary feminist textured response to the problem of wage labor. Um, she especially criticizes historians' narrow binary between liberal feminists who prioritize moving uh, women into male-dominated jobs and generally accepting the terms that men set for them, and radical feminists whose critique of the workplace was, as she said, bound up in their broader concerns with capitalism, the state, and hierarchy in all its forms. I would certainly agree that the division of 1960s feminism between liberal and radical leaves a lot of ground uncovered. 
Um, and on, as I will argue later, it also masks some fundamental contradictions within the feminist movement more generally. Elizabeth Fratrigo, did I say your name, Fred Frederigo, um, looks at the domestic side of the feminine mystique and the myth of the happy housewife. This cultural representation, she argues, shaped the limits of possibilities for women and in Friedan's rendition, trapped women in marriage and motherhood. It also entwined them in the sexual cell that is in the carefully constructed market for housewares, feminine products, appliances, and cake mixes. Um, in other words, the housewife became a critical player in the consumer market and thus a central factor in the growth of American capitalism. Uh, Friedan's critique of the happy housewife, she says, recognized the power of cultural representations and set the stage for the second wave, especially now's critique of images as a major factor in the oppression of women. Now, using Friedan's insight about the power of images, one of feminist, feminism's core goals, whether radical or liberal, was to transform representations of women, bringing more diverse, positive images to young girls and women, and men as well. But of course, as Frederigo notes, new images did not necessarily bring acceptance of broader feminist goals. In the end, women could be as exploitative as men when it came to creating profitable, sexy images. Um, despite Friedan's insights about the role of cultural representation then, um, she did not go, as, as Elizabeth said, she did not go far enough in critiquing the happy housewife. Most particularly, she uncritically embraced Freud and other homophobic discourses, and she never assumed that other than childcare was primarily a woman's responsibility. Now looking back at the feminine mystique, it seems to me to be a rather more nuanced and actually more interesting uh, book than it has been characterized over the years. The feminine mystique was at its base an identity crisis. It was an identity crisis framed in the language of a post-war moment of optimism regarding America's uh, abundance and the nation's capacity to fulfill human uh, uh, concerns all around the world. It was also framed in the concurrent security concerns of an expanding Cold War. The 1950s were a unique moment of psychic insecurity at the same time as the moment of great promise, increasing assertion of racial equality, expanding economic opportunity, the growth of middle, the blue-collar middle class, home ownership, and perhaps most importantly, education. American optimism was also, uh, also spoke to the nation's role and responsibilities in the world, uh, tied, yes, to Cold War geopolitical strategies, but at the same time, reflecting a certain positive vision of the, about the possibilities of human development, economic prosperity, and democratic participation. In a certain sense, for Friedan, women were an undeveloped nation poised to fulfill their human potential if only given the proper tools. That is, access not only to education, science, and technology, but also to a positive self-identity and affirmative role in human society. Over and over, she writes, of the failure to realize the full possibilities of existence, the human capacity to transcend, to live one's life by purposes stretching into the future, to live not at the mercy of the world, but as a builder and a designer of the world. The development of women, she says, has been blocked. The root problem for Friedan was how to unleash women's human potential. How, this is, she said, how a person can most fully realize his, she said, own capacities and thus achieve identity. And I want to just say that her use of the word his is really interesting. It, it certainly reflects the limited gendered consciousness of the moment. But I would say that it also reflects a kind of universalism that she spoke to in thinking about human potential. So that, that's just about his. Um, and so she uses it all the way through. Um, and yes, um, her answer was work but a particular kind of work, 
creative work of his own that contributes to human community. Now, I would say that the end of that sentence is really important. I would argue that Friedan was not posing what we now would call a neoliberal ideal of work as individual achievement. This was not a version of lean in. Um, rather, I thought she thought, uh, I, rather I think she thought that creative work by necessity had to include a social component. Work had to bring one into the world as a full participant. If a job is a way out of a trap, she says, it must be one she can take seriously as part of a life plan, as uh, Catherine talked about, um, as part of a life plan, work in which she can grow as a part of society. And again, she says, women can find identity only in work that is of real value to society. And women, Friedan wrote, needed to make a commitment to the world, not just to themselves and their families. She called for women to enter the arts, science, politics, professions, not as careerist ventures, but in order to be part of the human social life. She suggested an electric shock, an education shock treatment for women, particularly, I would like to note, uh, immersion in the humanities, which she thought was very important. Um, and she suggested that colleges, universities, labs, um, government offices all provide um, daycare, childcare, nurseries. She argued that uh, universities should uh, move towards more part-time teaching evening classes to enable um, people to, women to participate. So while it is the case that she did not specifically advocate for structural changes in the nature of capitalism, neither did she accept the status quo. This is not, as I said, Sheryl Sandberg's lean-in solution, although I would argue that Sandberg's book actually offers some interesting, useful advice for women trying to maneuver their way through professional careers. Um, indeed, Friedan's vision is more, is more subtle than simply adapting to the male business culture. She believes both men and women should seek to work, seek work in a way to improve society and realize their full potential as social beings, as human. And while her specific solutions may have been spoken in the language of white middle class education and career, I'm not so sure that the broader goal, full participation in the human social project, might not have had and may still have relevance to a broader swath of, uh, of um, both men and women today. In the fractured, polarized, and bitter politics that we see around us in the present moment, we seem to have abandoned broad transformative ideals. In that sense, the optimism of Friedan's critique might actually be more important than its class and race limitations for us today. In this context, what can we say about the impact of the feminine mystique on the trajectory of the feminist movement over the last 50 years? That's a big question. I would argue that perhaps her ideas were actually misread as much as they were adopted, and it was the misreading, the selective reading, or perhaps even the forgetting that shaped feminism in the 1970s and beyond. The political philosopher Nancy Fraser has recently argued that in a, what she calls a cruel twist of fate, the movement for women's liberation has become what she says the handmaiden of the globalized neoliberal state. How did this come to pass? Um, the second wave, Fraser says, promised two different possibilities, not unlike the ones that Turk outlined. The radical one looked to a world in which gender emancipation went hand in hand with participatory democracy and social solidarity. The liberal one promised a new form of liberalism able to grant women as well as men the goods of individual autonomy, increased choice, and meritocratic achievement. In recent years, Fraser argues, the liberal individualist has all but drowned out the more radical visions. Indeed, she argues that radical feminists are themselves partly to blame. The critique, for example, of the male breadwinner uh, ideal, the, uh, uh, the, house, the, the uh, family wage, has been turned, she says, into flexible capitalism. That is, as women have poured into the market the, um, the workplace around the globe, 
state organized capitalism's ideal of the family wage is being replaced by a newer, more modern norm, apparently sanctioned by feminism of a two earner family. Um, Fraser also argues that women's turn to gender identity politics dovetailed all too neatly with a rising neoliberalism that wanted nothing more than to repress all memory of social equality. Indeed, um, if you've looked, if you've seen Susan Faludi's recent profile of the writer and activist Shulamit Firestone in The New Yorker last April, a really important piece that I think everyone should look at. Um, but this piece provides a rather sobering look at the way that feminists lost sight of broad social goals in a sea of bitter sectarian fights to purify the movement. Finally, Fraser calls for a politics that emphasizes care work for exactly the reasons that Friedan believed women needed work, the realization of human potential. Um, Fraser calls for integrating the struggle to transform masculinist cultural values with the struggle for economic justice, severing the bond between our critique of bureaucracy and the free market by claim, reclaiming the mantle of participatory democracy as a means of strengthening the public power needed to constrain capital for the sake of social justice. I would say Friedan's own career and ideas were caught up in a swirl of second wave politics in which the politics that focused on male oppression shunned hierarchy or leadership and promoted a fiercely womanist politics ejected her as well as Shulamit Firestone and many others for identifying too much with the enemy men. But these women, Friedan included, saw the enemy not as men but as social and cultural structures that were ultimately limiting to both men and women. So where does that leave us? Perhaps with the possibility of a new coalition of progressive forces, a reuniting of the left, if you will, women sought separate organizations and a separate movement for good historical reasons, but perhaps it's time now to rethink the possibilities of strategic coalitions and unite around a positive politics of human possibility. Echoing the feminist, uh, the French feminist Simone de Beauvoir, I think that Friedan's last paragraph in The Feminine Mystique is still worth looking at. And this I'll read it to you. Who knows what women can be when they are finally free to become themselves? Who knows what women's intelligence will contribute when it can be nourished without denying love? Who knows the possibilities of life when men and women share not only children, home, and garden, but not, and not only fulfillment of their biological roles, but the responsibilities and passions of the work that creates the human future and the full human knowledge of who they are. It has barely begun the search of women for themselves, but the time is at hand when the voices of the feminine mystique can no longer drown out the inner voice that drives women to become complete. And I would suggest that in our present, you might say neoliberal free market world, this can actually be read as a rather radical statement. So. Thank you all. Um, we have, uh, would, I don't know if the speakers would like to comment uh, first, and then we have some time for questions as well. So if you have any response. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we do we have to turn these on. Yeah. The one thing I was reminded of um, with your comments is that for Dan did call for um, for meaningful work and that, sh that this was the way out for women from the housewife trap. Um, to find self-fulfillment, but she also does mention time ag and again that society is missing out on women's full capacities. And so she did speak to this kind of broader issue about um, what women's full participation in, in, in life um, could bring, not just for themselves, but for, for everyone else as well. So thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> Okay, so we, we have some time to open it up for questions, and I'll just sort of take hands, and um, there are, are going to be microphones circulating yeah. around the room. We want to capture so. your questions. 
Okay. Why don't you start in the front row here? Oh. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, two things. One, could you repeat the, uh, do you think you said someone Faludi's article, that citation in the April New Yorker? It's Susan Faludi, uh, and it's a profile of the writer and activist Shulamit Firestone, and it was in the April, I think it was April New Yorker, this past April. And, and secondly, um, I, I was very, I'm 70, and so I'm very much in that, the whole era that was spoken about. And um, I, I'm glad that you brought up her larger so picture of a social contribution. And I'm not sure that seeing young uh, middle age mothers now, I don't know, they're not middle age anymore, I guess, since we're still uh, looking at 85. Um, I, I'm not sure that they're really uh, fulfilling the larger goal that you express. I mean, it seems to me that they are incredibly stressed trying to manage family and work that is not necessarily fulfilling and is certainly not contributing to social good. And, this, and the notion that you need to work outside the home um, also denies to society the kind of contributions that are made uh, to society on a community level that um, are really important for creating a human development of a better society. Did you have your hand? Yeah. Um, I am also looking 70 in the face <laughs> and read The Feminine Mystique in 1964. And if it didn't change my life in bright lights, it shifted it. Um, I think we ask a lot of Betty Friedan and The Feminine Mystique. And we take her, we look at her from a 21st century perspective let me just mention a couple of items and as a perspective. The man in the gray flannel suit. It wasn't just women who suffered from the limitations of the 50s. Stonewall didn't happen until 1969. Male or female, homosexuality was absolutely off the agenda um, un until after that. The T Civil Rights Act was 1964. In the 50s and 60s, I remember in the 60s seeing colored only, white only drinking fountains. And, and you know, it, it isn't just those, uh, just women. They're, the limitations were strong for, and as far as class was concerned, may I mention the House Un American Activities Committee, which made dangerous anything that suggested had a slightest hint of communism, which erasing class issues could make one vulnerable to. So I only mention these to say that we ask a lot when we, uh, of Betty Friedan and the feminine mystique when we take her out of that context. There's, a, I also might mention that in 1869, Harriet Beecher Stowe and her sister Catherine Beecher wrote a book called The American Woman's Home. When you read it, you see that the American woman is defined as white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, Protestant, and middle class, period, full stop. So she's, she can't be everything um, at that moment in time. <laughs> Hi, uh, I, I just wanted to suggest, and I think we're gonna talk about it more later in the activist panel, but I think it's uh, something of a false dichotomy to uh, suggest that, um, uh, that the women who were in the radical end of the women's movement, of which I was one, and Chris Riddio, who's also on the panel, uh, was another. Um, and those who sort of espoused uh, joining the military-industrial complex were two different groups of people. Uh, and, and what I really want to point out, which I think is more important, uh, 
is the fact that but for um, the activity of Firestone and other women like us uh, who shared her view, uh, nothing would have changed. Uh, that it always is important and needed uh, for women to beat down the doors for others to walk through as it is for men uh, to do the same. So I think that I want to help us have a discussion about the continuum of activity that's led to the greater equality we see today and the fact that in the process of doing that kind of very difficult work, people became unhappy. And Firestone's just one example. Um, I can respond to that. I, um, thank you for your comment. And I think what I sort of meant in terms of folks who think about feminism in terms of this liberal and radical dichotomy, that's really how many scholars have kind of framed the second wave and sort of talked about it and taught it. And I think you know, a number of sort of path-breaking books and articles more recently have pointed out that chapters of now all over the country were engaging in both what we would think of as liberal sort of activism and radical activism. And so I think historians need to get a little bit more, we need to become a little bit more nuanced maybe in how we understand and think about and teach about, about the second wave and you know, who was involved in what it was all about. But I, I agree with you, thank you. Hi, um, I just wanted to ha see if you could, I'll stand up. Um, talk a little bit more about um, the women that she was writing about that were supposedly discontent that didn't pursue careers in the paid workforce, but were the professional volunteers. The women that, not just like in the junior league, but the women, and that's a whole, that's a whole another issue, but the women that were in the YWCA, right? The women, you know, they're white, middle class, educated women that choose not to enter the workforce or don't have the opportunity but still are activists, um, but m not to Fridan's standard, right? Well, I mean, the way that I read the feminine mystique, especially that last chapter, she sort of is saying that work in traditionally feminized roles isn't, it's good, but it's not enough to sort of create this vision of equality that she, um, that she imagines. I mean, women have been working in as professional volunteers for, for centuries, right, by the time Friedan is writing. And so I don't think she's trying to disparage that kind of work, but I see her really calling for women to, to break down sort of barriers in the workforce between the kinds of work men and women are doing. So maybe she's sort of saying that that kind of feminized volunteering is sort of necessary but not sufficient or something, that um, as long as women continue to play these female-dominated female defined roles, sort of both in the home and in the public sphere, be it in the paid labor force or as volunteers, um, we won't be able to create this sort of partnership of equals that Professor Levine was talking about. But that's just, that's my. And I'll actually chime in for just a second too. Um, a couple of other striking points that she makes in the book on, this, on the subject of women's volunteerism is, um, well, two things. One is she says, um, all of the sort of high-level volunteer organizing work in these suburban in these new suburban communities um, has sort of been done, and now the, there are. He, she actually says that there are sort of fewer opportunities for women to be engaged in really meaningful sort of leadership roles in a volunteer capacity because, in fact, there's been sort of a professionalization that's taken place as these new communities have gotten all of their neighborhood centers and youth centers and you know day camps and things like that off the ground. Um, and so she, she argues that there's um, kind of a decline in these roles for women. But then she also says on the flip side that because of the feminine mystique, women um, don't see themselves enough as leaders. They don't see themselves as being capable to take on a, capable of taking on a more active kind of leadership role in these volunteer capacities. Um, and that, you know, so, you know, they won't run for office. They'll be involved in the PTA, but they won't run for the school board. Um, and so she kind of makes the argument that, um, that women are too kind of hindered by their own sense of limitation brought on by the feminine mystique to act in a, to, to really take a more of a, of a leadership role in some of these volunteer um, ways. But she also, I think, is missing the extent to which women's volunteerism is a sense, is a source of civic engagement, is a source of political engagement. She, I think she, I think she gives it short shrift. 
can I just take a minute, I, since I'm going to take the prerogative of already <laughs> holding the microphone, to ask a question? I promise we've got plenty of time, so we'll get around the room. Um, I'm curious if you all, um, your presentations were, were wonderful. If, if you might um, talk a bit about Fredan's vision for men, um, or uh, feminists of the period who might also sue, and you were talking about this address, I think, what's happening now in terms of men's participation in what we might call third wave feminism. I don't know what wave we're in right now, but um, you know, as the mother of three tiny boys, you know, and I'm married to an enlightened man, uh, you know, this is coming from a, a, a personal place. But what you know, I, I I find the challenges quite structural in terms of bringing men into this conversation. And thank you to those intrepid men who are here with us today, right? But like, how do we make this not a woman's issue, but a human issue, right? As Sue, as you're saying. Um, you know, how do we break out of the mere FMLA leave, which is a crime? You know, how do we change that? How do we, um, you know, uh, uh, culturally push for uh, shared parenting, right? Um, what, what, what are the, you know, how, how do these feminists of Fredan's moment um, offer us uh, suggestions for our current moment on, on that issue, on the human issue? I think that's a really, you know, really interesting and important question. If you look at the founding statement of now, it talks about partnerships um, and the, the necessity of men and women in partnership with each other. Um, and that, I think, is really important to think that, you know, to realize that that's raised early on. Carrying it out, of course, is much more difficult, you know. <laughs> And one of, the, one of the interesting things, that one of the reasons why I sort of thought so much about her, Friedan's notion about socially creative, socially important work um, is because there's now a lot of discussion about care work and the significance of understanding and valuing the work of caring um, as well as the work of production. Um, and it seems to me that in thinking along that line, there may be a way to address men and women. Otherwise, I think the structural problems are, as you say, they're immense. And the cultural problems, too. The, I mean, you walk into a, I've got grandkids, and I've got two, do, two granddaughters and one grandson, and you walk into the little, you know, the kids' clothes shop, and they're totally divided you know, pink and blue, even to this day. So a lot of that stuff is very, very, it, it tied probably to the commercialization uh, and the consumption um, that's so central to our economy. But I don't know, you know, why don't you? Um, well, just, just to piggyback on what uh, Sue was saying, I mean, there were men present at the founding of NOW, and actually Richard Graham, who was one of the original EEOC commissioners, and. Um, for his year on the EEOC, he was the one sort of in charge of trying to define EEOC's sex discrimination policy. And he leaves the EEOC after a year to go help found now and become an initial vice president. And um, this is a topic I'm very interested in, sort of feminist men. How did the second wave sort of um, deal with male allies? And within a couple of years, it, it seems that the sort of masculine mystique um, committee within now. A lot of the men who were involved did these men's consciousness raising groups. Um, they would sort of uh, sit in a circle and time each other to make sure no one became the alpha male and talked too long. And they would make, make sure, you know, practice eye contact to make sure that everyone was listening, not just waiting for their turn to talk. Um, within a couple of years, these, these sort of masculine mystique guys and men aren't there anymore. Or they don't seem to be. And so this is a research question that I'm very interested in. Um, what happened to the feminist men? And you know, it was the National Organization for Women, not of women. And that was very deliberate, because they, as, as Dr. Levine was saying, they wanted to make sure male allies were included. But by, by the mid-70s, that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. So I'm interested in trying to know why that was. And just one other thing that I would oh. add, getting to the question of um, some of the structural issues involved. You know, Friedan makes the case that um, things like maternity leave are important if women are going to uh, 
um, move from the home into the workforce. But if you think about the way some of these things are structured even today for people who are fortunate enough to have them, um, the consideration is for female nurturers, for female um, child care, people giving child care, not for men um, in, in many instances. And so there's you know, another way in which that is um, kind of still hardwired into the system. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, this is partly spinning off of what you had talked about. Um, I was very sad when I read the last chapter of Friedan's book because she talked about fulfilling jobs and a life project. And I thought, gee, I wish I had had a job like that. <laughs> and I wish, mo I think most men would wish that they had had a job like that. So my first reaction was that there were not as many jobs as would fit for Dan's definition, nor are there perhaps as many people who can adequately understand their own strengths and define what they need. But then I was thinking of Studs Terkel's working. And I always remember the chapter he had about the checkout person at the cashier and how she talked about the pride she took in her work and the challenges she set for herself. So one thought I had was that Friedan limits her sense of what worthwhile work is as opposed to seeing a way to give value and dignity to all work, even not higher intellectual and spiritual work. And certainly when you talk about caregiving, um, not just of you know, children, but as we get older, of seniors, um, I think that becomes more and more important that it has to be all work that is seen as providing dignity and value. I don't think there's a question in there, but just a response. Right here. Um, I just wanted to mention that I was um, part of a discussion with Betty Friedan in Africa at the UN gathering in 1985 when she was writing The Second Wave. And she was gathering information from all the women. She sat under a tree, a certain tree, at the University of Nairobi every day. And you could go there and be part of the discussions. And the same question, the same question about, well, what do you do? You know, how do you change things deeply? Uh, and she felt um, part of the, the wave <laughs> that she brought up was how important it was for men and women to collaborate, and that's been mentioned already. And the younger women in 1985, I was 44 at the time, and there were 20-year-olds who were there uh, who didn't like the idea at all of collaborating with men. And she used the suffragette movement, you know, as a suggestion. But what we came down to in this particular, in this particular discussion that day, um, was how important it is how we raise our sons. We often concentrate on the girls in our family. And I have two daughters and one son. And I remember thinking when he was born 43 years ago, what a responsibility I had to raise a man who would be enlightened. And, um, What happened in our own family about feminism was my husband, you know, could listen to me forever and ever, and he knew I was going to these meetings. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but when his daughters in high school, their sports teams did not have the same money to take them places for their tournaments and game. I mean, that's what really changed him. I could have talked till I was blue you know, in the face, which I did. Um, but anyway, she was saying, and the group of us who were there were saying how important it is how we raise our sons, and also for the enlightened males that we think we're married to, um, <laughs> how they treat us and how they speak to their daughters makes an incredible impact. So. I came home in 85 listening with a different ear when my husband talked to me about things. 
in the presence of our children and so on. So that started a very interesting couple dialogue about, wait a minute, you think da da da. Um, so I, I just wanted to interject that as part of that second wave discussion in 85, she was saying how important it is how we raise our boys in this society. Uh, we had a kind of a Carler discussion about sports and the violence of them. We've got a lot, of, lot to do about that. Um, so it's important how we raise our children, what we expose them to, and what we are doing personally so that our daughters and sons see that we are trying to bring about this larger communal uh, view that it, whatever education we have, whatever smarts we have, is not just for ourselves but for the broader community. Uh, could I just say one thing? Um, that I think I totally agree with, with what you're saying, but one of the things that I think made the feminine mystique and made Friedan such a pivotal figure was that she also understood the need for a social movement. So she, the book is much, is a lot about individual identity and, and, and fulfillment. But she herself kind of projected that into a social movement. And social movements take many, many different forms and, you know, fight with each other and, you know, there are all sorts of things. But the core, but what, what I really think it was important was that ultimately the book played a role in a social movement, even as it played a role in many individual lives as well. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. We have some in the front. Yeah, I wanted to point out that Betty Friedan did not have a career. She took a writing assignment and was fired because she became pregnant. She was a Jewish girl in Peoria, Illinois. Quite a minority. And we always are asking people to write from their experience. But there's no question that she was very active after she wrote this book. Very active in basically seeing to it that there was a social movement. The first move that the individuals, Katie probably remembers how many there were in Washington, D.C. that met with Betty Friedan. But the first thing they decided was that each individual had to go into their own communities and start a change in their communities for women and men, because it, as you point out, it was a national organization for women. So I'd like to take a more positive note and ask if the genius of Betty Friedan, if you have a sense of what basically you felt changed our society. Why are we here after 50 years talking about this book. What is the positive response of her genius? Um, there are probably many of you out here who are academics who teach this book. And um, it's one of my favorite texts to teach because every, it doesn't matter what context, it doesn't matter which students are in the room, people respond to it personally. And um, I just taught the, the book on, uh, on Wednesday. And every time someone raises their hand and says, I, you know, I'm a single mom, or, uh, and I, I remember feeling this way, and I thought I was crazy. Um, and so I think part of what is so powerful about this book, I guess, for me in teaching it, is that it really resonates with students on so many personal levels. And also the fact that, as, as I mentioned in my comments, it's such a, it's such a a uh, great read. I mean, Friedan's such a, a beautiful writer, and she describes this problem women are feeling in such um, vivid detail, but also with, with such sensitivity that I think um, it's a very, uh, it's, it's, an, it's, it's an easy book to relate to, even if, um, you know, you're not a housewife in the suburban 1960s, sort of reflecting on these specific problems. Um, but, you know, questions about how to be a part of your community in a way that's meaningful to you, about how to, um, you know, have a division of labor in the home that makes you feel respected and makes you feel like, um, you know, your domestic contributions are valuable just as much as your sort of public sphere contributions. Um, these are sort of eternal questions that feminists really haven't, um, we've been grappling with since then and long before then. But um, I think she really strikes a nerve in terms of, um, of I guess, identity and um, self-fulfillment. 
This question is, um, she's asking how do students today take this, I mean, feel about the kind of issues raised? So. I think, I think it, so I teach a sort of a survey of US women's history, and I think everything up to the feminine mystique, the students feel like, wow, that was another group of people. That really was a different time. And feminine mystique almost becomes the pivot point where the students can both see, wow, things were really different, but at the same time, they always pers it, it always feels personal. And I think a lot of the problems Friedan is describing still um, resonate with young 20-somethings today. That's my experience teaching it. And I'd also like to I'd add like to that, oh, I'm sorry, sorry. just one, one quick um, comment. Um, for, for undergrads, when I talk about the feminine mystique, one of the things that helps drive home for Dan's point about you know, what she saw as the dangers of early marriage is to point out to my 19, 20, 20 year, 21 year old students how many of them would be married if this were 1963 or 1958 or whatever. And um, for the young women in the, the classroom to suggest to them that, so you're in college now, you might not graduate, you might get married, you might have a child, you might never um, go back to your education. You might never, you know, according to Fernand, you, you might never put to use any of the things that you think you're preparing yourself for now. Um, and so that's another um, point that I think really hits home for them. And yeah, and I guess I could just add teaching in Texas now, as I do. Um, I would say half of my undergrads in that class are already married. Um, a couple of students are, are divorced, actually, and they like to share that in class. Um, or it's, it's the, the, the folks and the students who, um, some of them are a little bit older, sort of non-traditional students, um, but the, the students who aren't married will sort of raise their hand and say, I came from a small town and all of my friends from high school are married or they're already having kids. And so it's, it seems to, um, they made a deliberate choice not to go down that path and maybe the kinds of problems Friedan is describing really hit home with them because they made a, a choice you know, in a cultural context where that might have been a little bit difficult. I want to just say, I think the, the, um, all of these are absolutely the profound kind of impact of the book, but the reason, one of the reasons we're here today talking about it, I think, is because Friedan really was a very good writer and she coined a phrase that captured the moment and this happens sometimes. <coughs> Um, and I think it was very smart. And you know, a couple of the phrases from the book, the happy housewife, the, the feminine mystique itself, were brilliant in a certain way to, you know, regardless of the surrounding you know, limitations and whatever else you want to say about it, in terms of the developing a cultural image, mm -hmm. she was very smart. I'd like to um, invoke another book in honor of Betty Friedan's uh, the Feminine Mystique, and that is Carol Gilligan and her colleagues, Women's Ways of Knowing, is in some way uh, an answer to the issues raised in the Feminine Mystique, in that women's uh, we, at this point in 2013, despite all the media talk about relationships, all the um, self-help books, you know, encouraging people to value and develop relationships, this has been characteristically the work of women to make and develop relationships. And without relationships, I don't think, without value being placed on relationship and a relational way of being in the world, you cannot have that community. Uh, despite whatever social movements you embark on. Uh, I guess I, I'm from the second wave and I believe, I'll admit this, I'll to this, that women are more highly evolved at this point in history than men. And that women have uh, an obligation, perhaps, to help 
uh, the other gender to evolve. <laughs> a true essentialist. All right, here's another question back here. I want to go back to Liesl's question about how do we make or humanize these movements. And I think one, of, one way to do that is to go back and acknowledge the um, gaps of information or um, the selectivity and also the marginalization of certain groups within these um, movements. So for example, it's important to remember that we women of color were actually the people behind the scenes who were making it possible for white middle class women to participate in these movements. <laughs> also that some of the women that we do hold as our national heroes of feminism, particularly Katie B. Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, were actually uh, actively making sure that, for example, American Indians could not vote. So I think that making this a hu humanizing these types of movements means keeping that in mind um, at all times. I think one of the um, issues that uh, I did not raise, although I often raise it in conversations like this, is the term feminism. And I think that it, in the, in it, Friedan's book marks a moment in which that term became much more widely accepted than it had been before for exactly the reasons that you raised. Um, but there are, that there are some issues in the nature of the term itself and the movements that have, la that have adopted the label feminism, which are fairly limiting. It's interesting, because in, in 63, and I think you can talk about this more, um, there were uh, you know, many women who were social activists who would not accept the term feminist. Um, so that's another, a whole nother conversation, but I think it's kind of underlies a lot of the issues that, that, you, that you raised. Could I ask, well, one of the titles, of, or one of the, the subtitles of the, the, the seminar today is the book that inspired Angered and Forever Changed America. Would you talk a little bit about the response to the book and how that anger either uh, helped or harmed the message that, that Betty Friedan was trying to to, to get across the, the, the sort of the anger response would be interesting, I think. Sure, well, um, you know, some of the people who were angry, even if they didn't read the book, but thought that they understood what it was all about um, because of reviews in the popular press or what have you, um, some of those people were men who felt as though Ferdan was undermining um, the sort of traditional way or the status quo in their own families. Um, some of those people were women who felt as though um, Verdan was really um, devaluing the work, the hard work that they did in their own homes, raising their children, caring for their families. Um, and you know, certainly there's a, as I kind of suggested in my um, my talk, there's a uh, a residual effect to this, to to the idea that Verdan paints such a bleak, bleak picture of the housewife role. Um, many women for whom you know, that was their life's work, felt as though she was really calling them out and, and resented it um, and didn't see themselves that way. And you know, one of the things I didn't mention is that for Dan, as, as important as it is that she points out how cultural images can sort of shape reality, she really posits a one direction kind of flow from the producers of messages to the receivers of messages. And she doesn't give women a whole lot of credit for having any sense of, uh, any ability to sort of resist those images or perhaps read them against the grain. Um, and so for women who, who, didn't, um, who didn't respond in a positive way to that book, it was because they felt as though she was casting them as really passive dupes in this whole larger enterprise of the feminine mystique and, um, and not valuing the work that they did. And, and there was, um, there was an after effect of that in terms of what happened when the ERA came to um, under the ratify uh, it came to be ratified or not ratified. Um, I can also respond yeah. a little bit to that. Um, can you just identify yourself, Michelle? Okay, I'm Michelle Nickerson. I'm one of the co-conveners of the Women and Gender Seminar and one of the organizers of this event. 
Um, the National Review, which is a conservative periodical, um, listed the feminine mystique uh, at some point in the past five years as uh, one of the 10 most dangerous books of the, the 20th century, um, which gives you an idea of how significant they believe the feminine mystique to be a, as being um, one of the most revolutionary books. And, and it speaks actually to how important the feminist movement was, generally speaking, in terms of how it changed, in, in the eyes of the conservative movement, family life and, and just changed America uh, you know, broadly writ. Um, and I think it, it, it speaks a lot about how, um, how much conservatives hated Betty Friedan, hated the book and how she portrayed um, housewives. Um, but also to speak in, in the same vein and answer another question about, you might, someone mentioned the genius of Betty Friedan. Um, another American historian, Jeremy Surrey, who writes about the convergence of 1960s social movements and Cold War geopolitics, um, actually documents how um, women in Eastern Bloc countries were passing around the feminine mystique. So even though the book was not speaking to their experiences in any sort of way, um, the book somehow resonated with them. And it was speaking to them, and it, it was also circulating within a, a very important social movements of the time. And, and so it was transformative in ways that we can't imagine, and ways that really angered conservatives. Um, I have so many thoughts going through my head, but one of the things I was thinking about is as a, I guess a product of second wave feminism, right? I'm a middle-aged woman with two young children and apparently I have it all, right? I have the career, I have the new house in the suburbs um, and, and the young children. And when you read the opening paragraph to, to the book, I said to my neighbor here, man, I feel exactly like that. I'm stressed out. You know, I can't balance everything. I'm up all night worrying about things while my husband sleeps peacefully through the night, every night, through all the feedings, through everything. And he's one of the enlightened ones, right? He's enlightened. And I think one of those problems is, and I talk about this with my students who are, you know, 18 to 22, pretty typical college-age students, is um, that what we are lacking is serious systemic change. Right? So we can talk about cultural shifts and we can talk about our enlightened partners, but what we really need are, you know, paternity, maternity leave, paid sick days. We need serious policy legislative changes. So it's, it's about leaning in, it's about feeling confident, it's about all of those things. Mm -hmm. But as a product of all of those things, as being told I could do all of those things and clearly have done them, um, I'm still stuck, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm struck by, how few women my age are here. I mean, this is awesome, you know, and I'm happy to hear about it all, but I'm wondering if like the title said, you know, from Betty Friedan to Sheryl Steinberg, Sandberg or whatever, what the audience would look like, right? Um, and so I think that it, it, it touches on a lot of the things here is that, you know, we talk about um, the rise of the middle class in the 50s and the 60s, you know, it was a direct result of the passage of the Wagner Act in 1935 and the increase of unionization, right? And, and I think what Sue was talking about, this the shift between liberal feminism and radical feminism and radical feminists' um, critique of, you know, the, bread, the idea of the breadwinner, of the single uh, wage earner family as, you know, a patriarchal, trope and I mean I, I you know I went through the separatist feminist stage so I, I know that <laughs> that ideology but what you know so embracing this idea of the dual homo you know the dual bra the dual family income is highly problematic right because it 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 layers so many more problems onto however you want to frame your family right um, so what we really need is, is both cultural shift and social shift, and even among academics, there's this debate, right? I mean, my colleagues, is we need the social conscious shift, you know, and that will fix these problems of the family and our society. We also need to pile onto that some kind of policy shift, right? And I, I wanna hear a little bit about it, and I think in the afternoon we'll hear some of that, hopefully from 
the folks who are on the ground, but, but how does that also address all of this? And what would be to, you know, Betty Friedan say to, to that piece of it? I kind of wonder you know, where, where she would come on with that. So thanks. Yeah. Can I have? <laughs> my, my comments are really partly to your comment, because I just was rereading Doris Lessing's The Golden Notebooks. And there are passages in there that just sound like they're right out of the feminist mystique. And this was long before. Uh, women who lived lives of quiet desperation and were writing, you know, letters of seeking advice. Uh, I met Betty Friedan in the 90s, and I'm a gerontologist, and that was when she began hanging around the Gerontological Society in preparing to write her book on aging. And uh, it was clear that she was pretty disillusioned with all the things that had happened out of her work. You know, in the sense, I had the distinct sense she didn't really like women very well anymore. Um, and she was primarily looking for some way of explaining why it was so difficult. All the things that we've talked about today, uh, why don't things change more rapidly and more effectively? And why are all these great ideas not being implemented? She read about the work of my colleague, David Gutman, uh, who really had, as she said, the only reasonable model that explained this. And it's a model that I know very well because I published with him on it. And it's a model I didn't like at all. Uh, but she was really intrigued with it because he basically says that, that you know, the gender distinctions and differentiations, A, are kind of built into the human experience and B, don't last very long. I mean, all your, it's masculine, but not masculine forever. It's feminine, but not feminine forever in the way that we know it stereotypically. <laughs> and that as you go into later midlife, you can reclaim all those qualities and characteristics that you repressed. And he says it's in, it's in the service of the human evolution and human well-being and the care of the young. It's not have anything to do with social evils or bad men or greedy women or anything like that. And she was really, really taken by that. And I, um, I, I think she tried to work on it, but of course she didn't really, her book didn't have the same impact. Her book on aging did not have the same impact, that feminine mystique, because most people are not interested in books on aging. <laughs> and uh, it didn't have that same pizzazz. But I think that's, um, I don't know whether anybody else is gonna really bring out that other phase of her career, but she did really move away from feminism and into looking at the aging experience and, and I think re, redefined and re-experienced a whole lot of the issues uh, in a very different way. We'll take a, a few more questions. I wanted to just say something um, in terms of what Emily was raising and I think that it's it's really it's a difficult problem in thinking about the evolution of social movements. It's a little bit like be careful what you wish for. So, uh, you know, the, the 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 critique that feminists, women, the women's movement made about the breadwinner ideology was a fair enough critique. The way that that became played out now rests on your shoulders. Um, you know that yes, sure, you can go into the workforce. Good for you. You can earn a, earn wages, but nothing else around it changed. And so that's a little bit why I think the I, I tried to suggest at the end of my comments that perhaps the feminist. Um, movement or the th thinking about the social movements need to come together in some ways and 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 work at, or think about issues in a in a mm, sort of more collaborative climate or something like that. Anyway, that's yeah. Go ahead. What were you going to say? Oh, um, but but I also think that that will require. Um, overcoming some pretty significant class divides among women today who might you know, all consider themselves feminists. But um, I think more than ever, we sort of see a chasm between women who you know, are in professional settings and women who you know, are not, who are in sort of pink collar or sort of service settings. And I think um, 
the kind of revolution that we're all sort of talking about is going to require women seeing their underlying commonalities rather than sort of defining themselves against each other in some ways. Right. So I think it's about working with men, but it's also about working together. Mm -hmm. And I would add as well um, two things. One that, you know, as Katie pointed out in her discussion of Sears Roebuck, and, you know, I heard practically the exact same language being used today um, with regards to the movement to raise the minimum wage for um, food industry workers, um, that, uh, you know, the low wages paid to contingent employees is subsidized by you and I, um, and you know through the the, the need to for, for people to avail themselves of other public programming public programs to sort of make ends meet. Um, so that's one structural impediment. And in other words, something something would have to be given up um, to make possible other things like federally subsidized childcare. And you know, of course, mm -hmm. there's a little bit of that now, but. Um, and then the other side is, you know, within the home itself, Ferdan always talked about in, in The Feminine Mystique that men would benefit from women's self-fulfillment, um, right? Their wives would stop being so miserable, and um, so they would have happier, better marriages. But what she doesn't spend a lot of time talking about is what men would have to give up um, to help facilitate this transformation in the housewife role. Yes. Oh. Um, you, you mentioned just briefly a topic that Betty did not discuss, and I've always thought was really the only way to equality of any kind, radical or liberal, and that's child care. Um, we became, I'm slightly younger than some of the women who are feminists here, and a lot older than a lot of you, but um, we've created this new pink collar class of underpaid babysitters who watch first our kids, then our moms. Because we have the equal right to become investment bankers and stay out all day long. Um, to watch gay marriage become law in the state of Illinois, to watch the amendment to the um, Civil Rights Act for based on gender, I mean based on sexual orientation, pass in a heartbeat. I see these are radical things that have changed in my lifetime, but Betty Friedan did not advocate, and no one really has advocated mandatory government-provided childcare. Because that's where I think women, and I'd like you to know what the young women think, we're afraid to give up raising our own kids. We think we are always our own best care providers. And so we've created this, we can't have childcare. I would say actually it's the case that she did discuss childcare in pretty significant ways. And, and if you look at the founding you know, documents and now they also address it. They, those, those issues the, the issue of childcare in particular fell underneath, I mean, in the progression of the movement, sort of took second place to issues in the workplace, I would say. And we can talk and think about why that was. I mean, there's, I think, interesting things to say about that. But I think it's, it is the case that those issues were raised. But, it, but as you pointed out in your comments, too, I mean, always in terms of a women's burden, not not, not the family's burden. I mean, and so it's still sort of a, gen, a gendered obligation that um, Friedan and now kind of believe you know tend to fall to women, as opposed to kind of the family in general, which would include men. Do we have time for one more? Yeah. Okay. So I I, I was nodding my head. Uh, you're Emily over there? I, have, I think we just, we're like living the same life. I'm over here, yeah. Um, but I was nodding my head as you were speaking and, I, uh, and it made me think about, about a year and a half ago at Columbia, we were lucky enough to have Gloria Steinem come and speak. And one thing she talked about that I'd never heard of before, despite teaching uh, women's studies and gender studies for the last eight years, is a caregiver tax. And maybe as an option to, or in addition to really having subsidized childcare, giving literal worth, monetary worth, to the work that caregivers do. And the, cyni <laughs> the cynical part of me thinks, and Joan, I don't know if you've ever thought this either, but when Joan and I had kids in preschool, 
afterwards, uh, you know, after a couple of hours of preschool, we got together with many of the stay-at-home dads at that time, and there were stay-at-home dads hanging out with us. And the cynical part of me thinks that maybe, just maybe, if there are, and we move towards in a middle class or upper middle class society, more stay-at-home dads, that the world, or at least America, might start to really give financial worth to the idea of men caring for children. Oh, wow, this really is a hard job, and maybe we should financially support it in some way. Um, I know there are still many questions lingering, and the good news is we have an afternoon panel as well, and I think a lot of these issues will reemerge. I have a question again here about the ERA amendment, and that might be something we can talk about too. Um, but I think we should probably close our morning panel for now. It's been really terrific. Um, so applause for our panelists. Thank you.